Well, Manifest is now on the air. I appreciate you for tuning in. I'm in my studio here in Tennessee. And we, we put up on this monitor the title of the message, Four Things That Will Trigger the time of the end, four things that will trigger the time of the end. And of course, so many of you enjoy the prophetic updates and the prophetic insight that we try to present to you. Although we preach a lot on warfare, the things concerning the spirit world, uh, so many other things as other than prophecy. So we want to delve with this because we're really in a very important time and season. Uh, there are about four places in the Bible, maybe five total, were in the four Gospels, not the Bible, I should say the four Gospels, that there are some specific indicators of signs before the return of Christ. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and some references in Luke 17. Now that does not include the parables of the kingdom. Uh, there are, there's the, there's the parable of the the ten virgins, the parable of the king's son's wedding, uh, the parable of the profitable and unprofitable servant that can relate to uh, references concerning the return of Christ. But in, in Luke 21, 28, one of my favorite verses, it reads, And when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption is drawing nigh. And there's four Greek words for redemption. And that last word redemption refers to the redemption of the physical body where we are changed from mortal to immortality. And the dead are raised called the dead in Christ who have had a covenant with the Lord. And they are also given a brand new resurrected body. So the redemption drawing nigh refers to the great day of redemption of the redemption of the body that the apostle Paul wrote about. Now Luke was a medical doctor and a follower of Christ as most of you know and many scholars believe that he was one of the two men on the road to Emmaus that met Christ and talked directly to him after his resurrection. Luke recorded that as it would be or as it was in the days of Lot and that's basically there in Genesis chapter 19. And as it was in the days of Noah, th that reference would be Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. So will it be at the time when the Lord would return. Now we know that there were certain signs that Jesus gave us in the, in the Gospels. He said they would be eating, drinking, and that word drinking there is re reference to alcoholic drink, marrying and given in marriage. And we know all of those are happening. In, this, in, in, a, in the signs of, of Lot, they would be building and they would be selling and they would be planting. So all of this is connected together. We also know that in the story, especially of Noah, there are enormous number of biblical numbers that are used. You see seven days, you see the number 600, the number 500, the number 40, 40 days and nights of rain. You see the number 120, that man's days would be 120. And it's interesting that some of the numbers found in the story of Noah are also found in Revelation chapter 9. Now, we, we don't have time to go into that. That would be a different study that would sort of sidetrack us. But there are four events that will begin to merge at one time about the same time frame. And this is how you'll know you are on what I call the edge of eternity or the near return of the Lord. Now, I want you to pay attention to while I share this with you. The first sign, and I'm seeing this more and more in North America, is that men will come to the place, and this is men and women, where they will no longer repent of their sins or they will not see a necessity of repenting. There was a report that came out recently that said that according to polls and surveys, that American people are moving away from organized religion completely. It said that there are a number of the 40 and under generation that literally have no church affiliation, nor do they want a church affiliation. There's other groups of young people coming up that believe the church is irrelevant, that the church is somehow outdated. And so there's a real serious situation going on here. Now, Noah, according to the Bible, uh, preached for about 100 years. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that's how long he preached? Because he was 500 years of age when Shem, Ham, and Japheth were born. Now, if he's 500 and you get three boys born when you're 500, that means they were triplets. And that's an interesting thought to think about. 
Okay, so Noah preached for 100 years and the, you can go to the book of Peter and other references. He's called a preacher of righteousness. And yet out of all the preaching that he did, only eight people, eight out of the entire world population came in the ark. Noah and his wife, his three sons and their three wives. And uh, one of the things I believe, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you, maybe you've never heard of this, is that in the book of Genesis, it speaks about the Garden of Eden. And it tells us that there was one main river that ran through the garden and it parted into four heads. And uh, according to historians, and I've researched this, one would be the Nile River. One is an underground river that ran through Saudi Arabia that has disappeared. And the other would be the Hidekel or the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. Those were the boundaries uh, inside of those rivers of what was known as the Garden of Eden, because Eden was a very large place. However, I want you to pay careful attention to what I'm about to say. It tells us in the book of Genesis that the earth was watered by a mist that was coming up out of the ground. And it, it may be possible that the way the whole earth was watered was a moisture coming up from the ground. And they have never seen a major, completely major flood ever happen in Earth's history. So 1500 years after the creation of Adam, here's a man saying, I'm building this boat because a deluge is coming. It's going to be so bad. It's going to wipe out everything. Well, if you've never seen a flood wipe out anything before, you have no point of reference. Now, listen to me carefully. The same thing is happening today in that when we preach about the return of the Lord, we preach about the coming of the Lord. There are people that have no point of reference. They have never seen a dead body raised. They have never seen a living person change from mortal to immortality. They have never seen a transition from a mortal life to an immortal life in the twinkling of an eye. So when you begin to teach this and you begin to tell people there's a lot of unbelief. Now this is what the Bible says about the days of Noah. And we're gonna tie this together in just a moment. Second Peter chapter two and verse five. God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. First Peter 3.20 says, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Now notice this, God was long suffering for a hundred years while he built the ark, waiting for people, waiting for Noah to finish the ark, but waiting for people to repent. They didn't. And it says, uh, he waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls were saved by water. Now, if you look at, if you look at the days of Noah, he is preaching during a hundred years and can't even get a convert to repent only his family. Now, if you come to the days of Lot and you look at the days of Lot, you will discover that when Abraham was negotiating with God uh, to spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said he started out with 50 people and he said, Lord, if you find 50, will you spare the cities? And God said, yes. Notice what Abraham did. He went from 50 to 40 to 30 to 20 and he stopped at 10. Now, from a rabbinical perspective, the reason he stopped at 10 is you have Lot, his wife, you have two virgin daughters that were in the house when the angel showed up. And then in Genesis 19, 13 and 14, he had daughters and sons-in-laws, which means he had several daughters that had already married men that were living in the city. We believe, I personally believe after looking at this very carefully, that there were 10 people that Abraham knew had gone into Sodom with Lot, his entire family, but half of them had completely backslid. In fact, it says that when Lot began to warn them uh, that a judgment was coming, that they looked at him and they began to mock. They looked, they began to mock. What are you saying? Judgment's coming. So the Bible says that in the last days, there's going to come scoffers walking after their own lust and they're gonna ask this question, where is the promise of the Lord's coming? So this is very important you hear this. The reason that we know that we're at the time of the end and one of the triggers that we know is leading to the very time of the end and the return of the Lord is when men no longer repent. Now listen to these verses from the book of Revelation in the, during the tribulation period. Revelation 9.20, the rest of the men not killed by these plagues repented not of their idolatry. Chapters later, Revelation 16 verse 9, they blasphemed God's name and repented not to give God glory. Look at this third reference, Revelation 16, 11. They blasphemed God because of their pain and repented not of their deeds. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something because I have traveled as an evangelist for 46 years in the United States of America. I actually started preaching when I was 16 and traveling when I was 18 years of age. And I'm going to tell you something. In my earlier days, when we would preach on salvation or we would preach a message that the Holy Spirit's conviction would come, people would literally get up and run to the altars and turn their heart over to the Lord. It does not happen that way now. Now you have churches that very seldom even give a altar call on Sunday morning, or if they give it, they don't let anybody pray in public. They take them to a room, which is fine because they're getting their name and address follow up. I love doing that, but they don't let their, there's not a lot of quote unquote conviction or emotion in our services. And therefore what is happening, especially in North America, and here we are supposed to be a Christian nation, supposed to be a nation that's founded on the gospel, a nation of religious freedom. We're losing all of that. You know it and I know it, we're losing it because there's a whole culture coming up which is anti-Christian and anti-gospel because the true gospel, the true messages of the Bible on how we should live is contrary to the culture of today all over the world. So anytime you're saying something that's opposite to the culture, you're not going to be liked and people are just no longer repenting. To really see people repent, you're seeing more of it happen overseas in foreign nations than you are in America. And that's one reason why our ministry is putting more of an emphasis on reaching nations overseas with the manifest telecast and with what we're doing because of this. So listen, when people stop repenting, it's the time of the end and the gospel has come to a, a, a climax. Then we go into the tribulation period. It also goes very much with number two, how do we know it's a time of the end? Another trigger is when the cup of iniquity is full. Now, uh, sin in Hebrew is a word that basically means an offense against man or an offense against God. It's breaking a spiritual or moral law. Then you have a word in the Old Testament called iniquity. And that is a word that actually is translated as perverseness. And it's, it's, it move, uh, iniquity is moving from just a sin of the flesh into living in a perverted lifestyle. Now, David confessed his sin to God in Psalms 31, verses 10, verse 10, and also Psalms 36 and verse 2. And five times he used a Hebrew word, which referred to moral perverseness, alluding to him having an affair with another man's wife and having a child and having the man killed. And you know that story from the book of Samuel. Now we know this, that the Bible says that all of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. And one of the meanings of sin can be to, to shoot an arrow and it go completely off mark. So some say that sin is a missing of the mark, coming short of an expectation or a desire to do the right thing. However, we also know from the Bible that it says that your iniquities has separated separated you from me, says the Lord. And God says in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, then the Lord doesn't even hear me pray. Now, what do I mean by the cup of iniquity becoming full is a trigger that the Lord is coming very soon. Well, God was speaking to Abraham, talking about his descendants that would come and how one day he would bring them out of a nation, which would be the nation of Egypt, back to the promised land. And God says this to Abraham in Genesis 15, 16. I'll bring your people out in the fourth generation because they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, the Amorites were a group of people possessing the promised land and their iniquity, their offering their children to Moloch, their uh, adulterous situation and idolatry was so bad that, that God was going to judge them by allowing the children of Israel to come back in the land and remove the Amorites from the land. Now, Noah had 120 years from the time God told him that man's days will be 120. He had 120 years, but his Shem, Ham, and Japheth were born at age 500. The flood came when he was 600, which means he had 100 years to build the ark. So he had several generational cycles in which to warn people of what was coming. Abraham, uh, God said to Abraham, your seed will be in Egypt 400 years, four generations. Now that's a hundred years each making the four generations up. We do know, however, that when you go into the time of the end of the tribulation period, Revelation 17, verse five, Mystery Babylon, it says the cup of Mystery Babylon is full and that's 
when God strikes. So God will eventually move against the shedding of innocent blood on a nation or a city, Matthew 23. God will eventually move against people who are covenant breakers, according to Leviticus 26. And we're talking about spiritual covenants they've made with God. God will then move against a, and, and pr perform a judgment. And it always happens within one generation, Matthew 24 and verse 34. So as iniquity gets full, men no longer repent. That's a sign of the time of the end. It's a trigger of the last days. The third trigger is when covenant breakers become violent, this becomes a game changer. In the story of Noah, it says the earth was filled with violence. And that was before the flood came. In the story of Lot, very interesting story, two angels that came into the form of men met Lot at the gate of the city of Sodom. Lot knew what it was like in the city and he brought the two men into his house to protect them. However, when you begin to look at what happened in the story of Lot, we find out that the two angels that were taken behind the locked doors that the old men and the young men, this is what the scripture says, from the city gathered around the, the door of Lot's house and, tried, and banged on the door and said this, bring those men out that we may know them. Now, the word know there does not mean to know them in meeting them and greeting them and finding out their names. There's a Hebrew word for know, and it says, when it says Adam knew his wife Eve, it means carnal knowledge or sexual relationship. So this is what the men were asking for by bringing the two men that were uh, behind Lot's door out. And uh, let's go on down and read this verse of scripture that I've got here. But before they had laid down, and this is Lot and the men that were in the house. These, these were again, two angels in the form of men. You can read about that in the Bible. The men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed around about the house, both the old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said to him, where are, the, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out that we may know them. And again, I, as I said, that is having carnal knowledge with them. So the old men of Sodom had corrupted the younger generation and they had become what Romans chapter one talks about reprobate minds. And the Bible does warn about reprobate minds. And that means someone whose mind is morally completely worthless. Now, this is what the men of Sodom said. They said, stand back. Now they're saying this to Lot. And they said, this one came in here to stay and he keeps acting as a judge. Now they're talking about Lot judging them for what they were doing. Now we will deal worse with you. They're saying to Lot, we're going to deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against uh, the man Lot and came near to break down the door. Now the point I want to make here is this that the men of Sodom became violent toward a righteous person. I've seen videos where men would be on the street preaching in the United States in certain cities and people would spit on them, throw eggs at them, throw rotten food at them. And one instance, they actually beat the man down and the police, I hate to say this in that town, really did nothing about it. They basically told the guy, well, you shouldn't have been stirring things up. We, when we, and I want to make a statement. I want you to listen to me very carefully because this is a prophetic warning from the Lord. When you begin to see in the United States the earth become filled with violence and you begin to see that the righteous are made fun of in the media and you begin to see that godly people are mocked and when you begin to see that they start arresting people for making the stand for what is right, you listen to me. God will change this scenario and you will see earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and tsunamis coming to the United States and it will be a result of what I just said. Write that down and date it that Perry Stone said it. The fourth thing I want to tell you very quickly of what happens uh, in the last days is, and, and, I, and I believe I'm going to run out of time here. So let's just, I have a, a little outline in front of me. Let's move on into that outline because I want you to understand that the shedding of innocent blood is what is going to bring about the judgment uh, in the United States and around the world. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said to the people of his day, Jerusalem, I would have gathered unto me, but you shed the blood of the righteous and of the prophets. So upon you will come complete and total desolation. In fact, the Lord said, Jesus warned him in Matthew 23, that his generation would have all the blood from Abel. Remember Cain killed his brother Abel outside the garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were expelled. From Abel to Zechariah, whom you slew between the porch and the altar, 
all of that blood is going to come upon you. So the fourth warning and the fourth trigger is when you begin to see the shedding of blood, whether it's infants or adults, and you begin to see violence and you begin to see a lack of respect for human life, that is the fourth trigger indicating the time of the end. And I want to add one more. I guess we could add one more while I'm, this is coming to my mind. There also will be in the last days a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all of the sons and daughters. Joel 2, 28, 29, Acts 2, verse 17 and 18. It talks about God's going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. So the preaching of the gospel, and this is for the church, the preaching of the gospel is a part of the church's responsibility. I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about the kingdom of God, the church, people that are born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then the outpouring of the Spirit accompanies the preaching of the gospel around the world. So when you and I hear reports, and if you'll keep your ears open, you'll hear these great reports of what God is doing throughout the world. Uh, we have uh, in one nation, we do what is called the lens of a camera where we come on a big screen. We preach in certain nations. We've done this in different places and we're seeing tremendous results. It's as powerful as standing on that platform and preaching a message right on the platform live. And we do it on a big screen. This is one way you can preach the gospel. And we're seeing many that have never accepted Christ as Messiah and a Savior come to know the Lord. And so out, the, the United States is in a very serious situation and we're at a crossroads and our decisions that we make to either follow God or reject God will determine the blessing of the judgment that we're going to have in, in, the, in the time ahead. Outside the U.S., there's entire nations that used to be Christian nations. They're completely cold now. They're completely away from God. But there's other nations that have never heard the gospel that people are coming to know the Lord. The gospel is going to be preached and then the end's going to come. So here's the message again. Let me show you the message. The message was four things that will trigger the time of the end. And I've given you those four things and I hope you paid careful attention. Now, something really fun. It's, it's very different, but you've got to see this. This is my wife's voiceover. I'm going to show you something you need to participate in. So watch this and I'll be back. You, your family and friends can now participate in America's very first Christian-based treasure hunt with prizes awarded to the winner with an estimated value of $500,000. The Treasure Book is a fictional story of Perry Stone's daughter traveling the Appalachian mountain chain, using her father's clues to search for a hidden key that releases the door to her inheritance. In the book, a special key has been hidden that when found will award valuable gifts to the finder. Follow the rules, compile the correct clues to discover the hiding place, and then retrieve the key. Present the key to Perry Stone, revealing how you solved the mystery from the book's clues to be awarded the fabulous gifts. Prize items were donated by businesses and individuals specifically for this search. The items include fabulous diamond, tanzanite, ruby, sapphire, and emerald rings, valuable earrings, bracelets, necklaces, and gemstones, elaborate gifts from Israel, including trays of bronze coins, silver Roman emperor coins, ancient silver Greek coins, and valuable Jewish coins of antiquity. The prize also includes gold, silver, and platinum American coins with numerous Morgan silver dollars along with one ounce silver bars and silver rounds. Included are American Eagle, graded and slapped silver dollars and signed sports and celebrity cards. There is a major stamp collection along with authentic ancient Holy Land relics. Two of the highest valued prizes are a famous and rare 1,950 year old temple shekel and a beautiful gold Roman emperor coin. Anyone of any age can participate. You will need the book, The Treasure, to solve the mystery of the hidden key. The search is designed for individuals, families, youth groups, and small groups. Work together to solve the puzzle. Many of the clues can be solved from your home or office. However, a trip must be taken to discover the final clues and the exact spot. No one who has in the past or present worked for Perry Stone or any of his ministries are allowed to participate. Eligible individuals can participate by purchasing the 152-page, full-color, 28-chapter book, The Treasure, to research clues to the key's hiding place. The book is $35, and there is a limit to per family. It is only available through Voice of Evangelism and not in any bookstore. Income from the book goes toward the Voice of Evangelism's seven-point outreaches. 
Order this exciting and unique book by calling 1-888-21-BREAD or go to perrystone.org. You can also request the book by mailing in your donation of $35 or more to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320, and request offer TR1. Order now and be one of the first to receive your copy and begin a fun journey with family and friends to research the clues and solve the mystery. Greetings, everyone. Perry Stone here. And in a moment, I'm going to share with you some places that we're going to be coming to to minister. There is so much chatter, excitement about the the Appalachian treasure hunt. Appalachia is how it's pronounced, but it'll go either way. (laughs) And uh, here's the book. And I want to encourage you to get this. Grandparents are saying to us, my grandchildren are just have gone wild. They are wanting to come over. They're wanting us to sit down with them and read through it together. Parents are telling me that their kids that normally stay on their phone and and don't want to be around the house are now telling the parents, why don't we do this together? They're actually sitting at a table, reading it, taking notes. I'm going to give you a clue. Everybody pay attention. I'm going to give you a clue. How, if, if, if this were me and I have done treasure hunts before, how would I do it? First of all, read the rules. Secondly, read the book through once slow. Then read it through twice. Don't go to chapter one and try to find clues and then go from that point. That would be my suggestion to read it slow out loud, out loud before the whole family once and then read it through a second time once and then start uh, start the process. But here it is. Don't, don't forget to get yours. I mean, this is this is great. This has this, there's some stuff right there has all kinds of pictures and it. it's not just reading. So anyway, uh, we appreciate you guys that are participating. It's going to be a lot of fun. Now, I'm going to be coming to the Upper Room Revival Center with Pastor Mark Gilbert in Corbin, Kentucky, Kentucky. Parts of the state are right now in major revivals, not just that college that was there, but churches. Churches are calling me saying, People are coming in off the street. So look, if you know where Corbin, Kentucky is, I want you to join me. It'll be uh, uh, April the 1st and the 2nd, okay? And then we're coming April the 7th to Free Life Worship Center in Boaz, Alabama, Pastor Jeff Stanford. And if I'm not mistaken, that's on a Friday. Look at your calendar and see. Church of His Presence in Daphne, Alabama, Pastor John Kilpatrick's Church on April the 16th. Uh, Of course, don't forget the Prophetic Summit. The Danville Church of God in Danville, Kentucky on May 6th and 7th. And of course, back to Steve Muncie in Munster, Indiana on May 17th. And here's what you can do. You can go to perrystone.org and look up itinerary. Find out where we're coming to. You can go to perrystone.org to also look up just an enormous amount of books and resource material to help your spiritual edification. And we don't want you to forget that we have been airing a lot of um, uh, programs that we taped in Israel on our YouTube channel. And you need to really watch these. I mean, it's it's all new stuff, new teaching, new information, and they're nu- everyone is a nugget. So I do hope you get to watch that as well. We hope to see a lot of you at our summit in April. God bless you and continue to pray for us here at the ministry.